I'm here at the MAGFest 2016 Land Room. It's one of the largest lands on the East Coast, and as I'll probably show in another video, one with about the most ridiculous network system you'll ever see. Right here, though, is a little tiny ESP8266. Let's see if we can get it to focus. Right there. And unfortunately, it doesn't have a regular frame buffered output on. You know, unless you use channel three, which is just an awful solution. But if you want something better, it can actually serve up VNC. And so this is using that age old technology, VNC, to go tell the client here what to render. And as you can see, it's actually kind of in 3D. So if you jump, you can actually see that it's uh, a bunch of bullets, a bunch of, bunch of other players, and a bunch of pylons. This game is called Pilotron. It's available on GitHub. The link is in the description. And the general goal is destroy all of the pylons, which you get points for, and kill all of the other players. So, as you kill players, you can accumulate 100 points. By killing a pylon, you get 50. And if you die, you lose 100 points. So it's a, a very fast-paced game where you have a whole bunch of players that try to kill each other in order to keep moving. Now, this entire game actually runs on the ESP8266, and it's communicating using a render frame buffer, the same thing that's used in VNC, in order to tell the clients how to render. I'll probably go into that a little bit later. But right now, let's just see what happens as he starts killing some more of these things here. Whoop, he's almost dead there. Up, up. No, don't die. Uh, uh. Okay, so he just killed player red. Let's see, this is yellow right here. There's only a few pylons left. Oh, one of the other interesting things. So here is the high score screen. And this happens at the end of the game, which shows you what all the different scores, kills, deaths, all of that are. And right here, hooked up to the ESP8266, is a strip of WS2812 LEDs. These show the high score ranking of what players in first, second, third, fourth, and etc. Admittedly, developing this directly on an ESP8266 would be quite the daunting task. So, instead, I decided to develop it on my Linux computer. But, you may say, oh, well, how do you just transfer it? <clears throat> well, it's the matter of interfaces. Because, right now, there is an interface file I can develop on Linux, but then port it very easily. When I say interfaces, what I mean is the same sort of thing that was done when I ported Minecraft to an AVR. Instead of trying to use Berkeley sockets, which are terrible for trying to keep things small, instead, I just have some really basic functions, like, is there data waiting for this client? Can I start to send a packet for this client? Send some data to the currently open sending connection, send one byte, two bytes, four bytes, four meaning like a uint32, or once we're done, say nsend. This kind of interface makes it really easy to have a server where you can have all of these different features, reading, writing to sockets, and you can do so in a way that in this case we have a file that makes it compatible with Linux, or in the case of the ESP, we can have another file that makes it compatible with the ESP. So in here, in user main, we have the same sorts of functions. So here, start send, send data, send one, send two, send four. Because this code exists both for Linux and for the ESP, as far as the game development and render frame buffer development was concerned, because I had to write all the functions to display all the things to the clients, it was a lot easier to write it in Linux, where I could just immediately go and say, make clean all. Boom, now I can go run the server on Linux, instead of having to program and retest the ESP. So it's kind of a testament to how interfaces can really help in this situation. This here is the font that I used for this Pilotron game on the ESP8266. Unlike most projects where you would store a font in the actual data, like all of the pixels here would be something in the game, instead, 
In order to conserve space on the wire, we use something called RRE, which is basically a series of rectangles that we can tell the render frame buffer to draw. So for instance, if we want to draw H, instead of having to store all of these pixels and all of these bits, instead what we can do is we can draw them as rectangles. So this, boom, this, boom, and this are all you actually need to know how to make an H. Now granted, some of the other letters are a little bit more complicated to get, it still saves a lot of space just to be able to store the shapes that the letters make. This is done by using a fonter. This file right here opens up this image and figures out what shapes to draw over all of the objects in order to make them all fit. So for this, this geometry right here, we can see that the total places, the total number of pieces that were needed to represent it, is, is actually only 1564. So for all of these characters here, I believe it's all 256, or, yeah, all 256 letters, only 1,564 rectangles are actually used. So in my book, that's a pretty good compression ratio. This here is the main FPS file, fps.c. So this contains all of the logic for all of the players, their points, the, the everything, including the rendering. Unlike normally, how when you use VNC, you would normally use it to connect to another person's computer and see their desktop. That means that it's just transferring over the network an image of their, their desktop. Instead here, we're using it simply to push geometry. The ESP has no recollection of what somebody has on their screen. It never renders it. It doesn't care because it can just push it to their screen and be done. So the way the ESP actually does this is it iterates through all of the possible things that might be displayed. That includes the players and the pylons and the bullets the players may be shooting. And it renders them into this list of objects. And that, that actually goes into a heap. So a heap is a data structure that allows us to store data and when we're done, pull it out in a specific direction. That's really important for later. We start drawing a frame and that's just saying clear the screen, let's get ready to go. If you just got hit, we want to turn the sky red so you get that like visceral like, oh, I just got hit feeling. Or just blue if it's, you know, normal. And so seven in this case means red and eight in this case means kind of a, a bluish, uh, kind of not quite bright blue, but just regular blue. Or if it's not really anything going on, just green. So real simple, just colors, green for the ground, blue for the sky. And it matters that we draw them in this order. Let's, let's uh, open up a copy of the game here. So we're actually going to draw here. So the sky is blue, the ground is green, and I can uh, kind of walk around here and shoot things. Let's see, oh, enter, there it is, okay. So I'm shooting these, these balls and they're hitting things. And I'm shooting that pylon, we can see that that pylon's green and we can walk around and see that other pylons will get in front of it or behind it or however it needs to be. So that's all done by drawing all of the pylons, storing them in this heap, and then drawing everything in the scene from the back, things that are way back there. Let's go shoot that so we can just get an inkling there. Drawing that all the way forward. That way, when we, when we want to draw the scene, we have it so the objects that are in the foreground are drawn in front of the objects in the background. If we were to draw it in the opposite order, then we'd be able to see straight through the objects in the foreground to the objects in the background. So the idea is we render all those things, we store them up, and then we go and we send them to the client. So we check to make sure that, that the object is visible, because if we spin around, we can't see that object there. So the green one is now behind us. So we don't want to send that to the client. Instead, we only want to send objects that are visible. And we draw that is just a block we send that to the to the to the client last thing we draw on the screen here uh, main part of the screen is this little red dot in the middle it's just drawn using telling the client to render a square and 
right here. If the game is over, oh, that just stops there. But uh, if the game is not over, or however we're, we're rendering it here, then what we end up doing is we'll end up drawing for the bottom this text. So we actually only draw one thing at a time every frame, otherwise we'd spend too much time sending data to the client, and it's really critical on the ESP to minimize the amount of data that we're sending to the clients. So for the first frame, so you can see which, for the first frame, we're sending just the health. Boom. Right there. For the next frame, we're sending the player's points. Right there. Next frame, kills, deaths, bullets, and pylons remaining. So kills, deaths, bullets, and pylons remaining. So I'm just going to go kill this pylon right here. So you can see it gets smaller, 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 and now it doesn't exist anymore. And that's how we actually push all of this 3D graphics to the player. There's a little bit of magic going on inside of here in order to determine the, uh, the, the position of the pylons and the sizes because as objects in the distance have to be smaller than objects in the foreground. Some of that's using these really cute tables. Um, so, TATAN2, I actually forgot which file that's in. So in here, we have basic mathematical functions, sine and tangents, and these take advantage of tables. So rather than doing some sort of magical transcendental function for sine, which is really hard to do and all that, uh, we can look up in a table right here and just get a value out. So that's why it's a little bit janky when you're playing the game. Here, let's go back here. So as I'm, if I'm turning, you can see the objects are kind of lurching a little bit and not really smoothly going. That's a function of the tan function and the sine function being, well, just terrible. Instead of having a nice smooth output, we have this chunky moving from 0 to 6 and so on output. So it, it makes the data a little bit worse, but at the same time it's a really small table, it makes things go really fast, and the ESP just absolutely adores that. In addition, we can do all of these things on Linux so we can make sure everything's still working before we move it off to the ESP for the actual game. So that's, I guess, kind of a crash course on how all this goes together. If you wanted to make a game like this on the ESP here, you could totally just modify this fps.c file here and change the rules, change the behaviors, and still have any kind of first-person shooter that you want, so long as all of the objects in that first-person shooter are made out of squares. I hope you like this video and associated uh, explanation. If you can, uh, just comment. Give me a heads up what you'd like to see more of, and I'll try to keep making these videos. Thanks for watching.